I was thinking about you and I was thinking I was I was looking over your channel. This was a, um, I started to do that again a couple of weeks ago. I was just looking at how prolific you are and uh, you know all the different kinds of people that you have on and you talk to them for for a long time. And I thought of how that's sort of a, a whole other kind of you know nonfiction world building. Mm. As we were talking about world building, a couple of uh, I think it was a couple of conversations ago. Maybe it was our first. Uh, I think we probably talked a little bit about it every in every episode. I think in every time because it's I know it's it's such a topic in fiction. How can you how can you avoid it, right? But I was thinking about what a world you're building and how much. Um, well, I don't know how much research goes into each of your conversations, but you certainly, I'm, I'm sure some, and you certainly learn a great deal talking to everybody. And I'm, I'm wondering how, you know, how you start to see things connecting mm. in the same way that like when I'm building a world, a fictional world, yeah. um, over time, I really start seeing things connecting and the world becomes fleshed out in a way that obviously it can't be when you're first starting and and it takes a long time to get there it's a bit like learning a language mm -hmm. where at first you just know vocabulary words then you can have simple conversations and then there's this breakthrough and you suddenly find yourself able to have a conversation yeah um i mean do you see that do you feel like um you're able to connect things and pull things together in a way that, um, you know, you would simply wouldn't have been possible maybe a couple of years ago, just because of the, the, all the, everything that you're absorbing. Well, interestingly, uh, the more I learn, the harder it is to connect things because uh, I mean, I, I um, yeah, it's get more, it, it gets more and more complicated over time just because uh, sometimes I think I already have a complete grasp over a particular topic and then new information comes up and then, I mean, it gets harder and harder for me to connect all the dots and new pieces of the puzzle appear and then sometimes I think it's a particular puzzle and then it's a completely different puzzle. And <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very complicated because at least if you're writing a fictional story, you have complete control over the world you're building, right? I mean, you can even yeah. take parts out or put parts in. I mean, you can construct whatever kind of puzzle, even if it's very complex in principle, you can have complete control over it. But I mean, when it comes to us trying to understand the world we live in, things just get more and more complicated and messy. And uh, yeah, I feel less and less confident about uh, <laughs> someone being able to come up with a theory of everything or something like that, because I mean, it's just overwhelming. And just to keep uh, updated with updated about uh, just one single topic is very complicated. I, the, all the literature that's coming out all the time, it's overwhelming for a single person to be able to keep up with it. So. Yeah, I, I mean, particularly now, I think in, in the past, I, the, it, the sort of iterative process was so much slower well, for one thing, because you didn't have, you weren't able to connect with people all over the world who might have been thinking about the same concepts, who um, might be just as smart or smarter than you, you know. And you know, now we're in this, we're now we're in this phase of of our development, our evolution, where um, geniuses are able to collaborate mm -hmm. all over the world, you know, without having to go to one another, without having to wait weeks as a yeah. letter arrives, you know, yeah. I, I think I, I might have told you this, but you know, I have this friend who's um, either grandfather or great grandfather. Oh. Well, he elect, invented the electric tram car. Mm -hmm. He's a Czech and, you know, streets are named after her family and all over the Czech Republic. And, and when um, she went through the restitution process in the mid nineties, you know, where things were returned to her family that communism had stolen. Um, one of the things that she came into possession of were letters back and forth between her grandfather and Thomas Edison on how to invent electricity. 
which is incredible, right? And I think if I have this right, if if Thomas Edison sort of invented electricity, if you can invent electricity, meaning he made a light go on, her right. grandfather uh, discovered the ability that to make things go, right? Like he invented the electric tram car. Okay, so mm -hmm. one turned on a light and one made things go, right? But it's just incredible to think that, um, you know, these, these men had to wait weeks and weeks and weeks mm -hmm. for each other's discoveries and then reply and how long that process was and that now it's instantaneous. Yeah. I can send you a DM, you know? Yeah. Yeah, or, and, it, and it's it's, uh, it's less than that. a second. Yeah. And so, I mean, the, just how everything has sped up. I don't know how. Um, I don't know how we can even keep track of it. I think we now need multiple people to keep track of it. Yeah, I mean, so, on the one hand, we're producing much more knowledge, much much faster. But on the yeah. other hand, I mean, that, that, that even puts things into perspective because uh, the collective is much more powerful and productive than the individual. I mean, particularly in the modern world, in modern industrialized societies, it's very much the case. Yeah. So, I mean, it's impossible. I, I, <laughs> I don't see how we will ever have geniuses again, like, I don't know, Isaac Newton or Einstein or Darwin, because for me, it's virtually impossible for someone to do what they did, what they did, uh, taking into account the amount of information they would have to be able to process nowadays. Unless, of course, uh, we get better at processing as time goes on. Um, I mean, just with something small, like, you know, when we first started driving with cell phones, right? There were all these um, articles about how people were crashing and that this was just an absolute disaster that people were driving with cell phones. And there were, you know, some cities ban that it's still banned others have not been so uh so draconian about it but people just got better about driving and talking at the same time and yeah. i think that you know it, it's and i'm sure that there was a similar um <clears throat> excuse me like with the listening to the radio listen to the music and driving you know when when mm -hmm. people first started listen to the radio in cars, whenever that would have been. I don't even know when the car radio would have, probably in the 1950s, car radio would have started. Yeah. But maybe we just get a little better. Yeah. I'm not better at it, but maybe my children are. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm just not sure if the human brain has capacity to process so much information because I mean, of course, yeah, Darwin, Newton, Einstein and others were able to process huge amounts of information. But now we're talking about like uh, that, uh, I mean, 10 times, a million times, a billion times that information. So, I mean, I don't know if it's possible. What if we merge with AI? <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's another kind of... <laughs> Another kind of question altogether. Yeah. That is a whole other question. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. By the way, let, let me put perhaps direct the question to you, but in another way, because I was thinking about asking you something similar to that, but different at, uh, at the same time. So, because you follow my podcast, and my podcast is very much about science. Mm -hmm. and philosophy as well, but mostly science, and you probably also follow other science podcasts. And I remember that back in 2019, the first time we talked, you mentioned <coughs> that in your stories, you also try to apply some knowledge coming from science, evolutionary psychology, whatever, to develop your characters, for example. Uh, I mean, 
what would you say is the role that science or scientific knowledge plays in the development of your stories and particular, particularly your characters? Well, in the series that I'm writing right now, in fact, I have a, a new book in the series coming out in just a few weeks. Okay. Um, it's, it's very, uh, it's, there's an archaeologist in it who is one of the, the main characters who is uncovering this ancient city of the, you know, this, this pre-Sumerian, very advanced civilization, advanced, not advanced, like they had flying cars advanced, but ancient advanced, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, you know, on, on par, roughly on par with the Egyptians, let's say. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's really the science that I'm focusing on, but it's, 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 it plays a huge role for one thing, because this uh, story takes place in the past, mm. but it also takes place in the present as he's excavating this past. Yeah. And the two, um, the two interconnect, you know, and, the, and, 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 and there's a flow between them. And it's also archaeology is something that I was really interested in as a kid. I mean, before Indiana Jones even became a thing, I had that sort of you know, I, I look back on the golden age of archaeology. I love to read about that as a little kid, really as a little, little kid. And then, you know, when I was still a kid, Indiana Jones came around and it felt like that was made just for me, you know, because I had always thought, oh, I, you know, I'd love to be an archaeologist. And, um, but now I just write about archaeologists and I, I make sure to put that in my stories. Yeah. But, um, as far as as any kind of technical knowledge, I absolutely try to be uh, as accurate as possible. I try to be as as timely as possible about it, so that when I'm writing about it, for one thing, it's real, and also it it enriches my ability to be able to tell the story. Mm. Especially since actually excavating this ancient city is part of the story, and um, that process, I think. Is in a way it's similar. You know, we we're talking about uh, how we always end up talking about world building here, right? But mm -hmm. it's very similar to that because I think writing fiction, like um, like science, it's a combination of making things up, meaning having a hypothesis, right, and discovering. Truth, you know, discovering what actually is true, and that is as true of fiction as it is of science. So, I mean, we're, you know, of course, I have more control because I can say no. This is what the character is going to do, but I think when I'm doing my best work, it's really not, not so much that I'm in control as much as I'm following the characters and I'm being open to, um, their, you know, what what feels what seems true, what seems true of human nature, what seems true of, of the, the plot that I'm constructing, whether that makes sense and how those um, two elements interact, you know, the one of human nature and one of plot. Um, and I, I don't think that's very unlike what a scientist does. And sometimes I have an idea for the story and I'm sure that this is what's going to happen. But as I'm writing the story, it it doesn't make sense anymore. That hypothesis falls apart. Mm. So, and I have to take the story in another direction. And sometimes an element um, enters the story that I never intended to put in there, but the idea comes to me. And I try it out. And sometimes it works beautifully. And that takes the story in another direction. Other times I go in that direction. I'm so excited about, about it because I think, oh, this is so interesting. And then I realize it's a dead end. Mm. And I think that that seems very much like the scientific process to me, at least as I understand it, um, the way it seems when I read about it. Mm. So, uh, or maybe let, it's, you know, or maybe it's yeah. just uh, stories like a scientist. I don't know. Yeah, uh, but let me ask you perhaps a more circumscribed question because I perhaps had in mind the more specific thing uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to your to 
your the development of your characters. I mean, their psychological traits, their behavior, their development over the story, the things they go through to, to transform their transform them or whatever. Um, I mean, of course, I assume that uh, through listening to podcasts and reading books mm -hmm. and wherever you learned about uh, behavioral science, particularly human right. behavioral science, psychology, anthropology, and th that sort of thing. Do you apply that knowledge directly when you're trying to come up with a character or do you rely mostly on your experience, for example? I think directly and indirectly, both, both is the answer. Um, and I would consult uh, behavioral psychology and mostly in, in terms of consulting beha behavioral psychology, I mean, I would probably, my process would be something like this. Um, first, that's a topic I'm interested in. So I've probably absorbed a lot of knowledge about it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think that I probably have more than average knowledge about it. Plus, my brother is a psychologist, and he and I talk have been talking about these things for years. I think I told you he works in the prison system and has for 20 years. At one point, he was managing the mental health for like 20 federal prisons. Mm -hmm. And he's also worked um, on death row. So I love having these conversations with him. He, he ha And he's he's such a, a science minded guy and he's such a, a, he's a deeply interesting and interested person. He, he reads prolifically and not just in his, you know, not just psychological uh, data and, 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 um, and that uh, he, he loves evolution. He loves science. He loves fiction. You know, he's, he's, he really uh, has a very rich mind. And so, you know, he's, He's able to talk about um, hunter-gatherer societies and compare them to gangs, for instance, mm. you know, and how those overlap, or 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 just criminal minds and how that oh. overlaps, and um, and so I, I I think for the most part, if I'm when I'm I have a lot of passive knowledge, so for the most part, I'm, I create my characters in a way that feels true to me and that's interesting to me. But if I have a character that I think, and I think I'm getting into something really com complex, um, I might have to get rid of him. He's just going <laughs> to snort at us the whole time, and it's really, it's really crazy. But and if, j just let people know that it's a yeah, dog. This is, I have a dog in about my <laughs> <laughs> and he snores yeah. and uh, he snores and, uh, you know, but, um, you know, if, if, for instance, um, I mean, really, like if I was writing a serial killer, I think I would consult my a brother. Criminologist. And I would, yeah, I would certainly consult my brother and I would ask him if he has some, you know, if he can suggest some reading material and what, what his point of view is and, you know, tell him what I think of this character and does he have any ideas? Absolutely. I think if I was um, writing about uh, the pathologies of, um, well, of the poor, you know, and if like the mountain communities here, because, you know, I, we're we have, um, you know, subgroups of people here who, who kind of live in the hollers and it's like Loretta Lynn, you know, country, how she grew up. I don't know if you know anything about the country singer Loretta Lynn. There was a movie about her, God, like 40 years ago, coal miner's daughter, you know, but um, I would uh, consult my friend and neighbor who does a lot of forensic psychology work and who has has worked with a lot of these poor communities and understands them really well and she has this very interesting dichotomy in her work because she has worked uh you know with the richest people in charlottesville but also the poorest people in charlottesville and this is just a little aside but i always found this interesting and i've been trying to get her to write about this but she talks about how the pathologies of the very rich and the very poor are so similar because they don't have the usual constraints around them that uh, people like you and I who are, uh, you know, in the middle category, we have constraints around us. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to work, we have to, you know, we have all of these 
responsibilities and that those responsibilities um, keep us from spiraling out of control. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've always found that really interesting because you never think about the, the, the poorest and the richest people having much in common, but uh, at least from a psychological perspective, <laughs> they do. Uh, so that's something that, um, so yes, I guess the answer is yes. It, it, when I get into, when I get out of my depth, I, I definitely um, consult uh, either someone who, who has firsthand knowledge as, and is an expert, or uh, you know, I ask for reading material so that I can go and I can, I can read about it myself so that I'm not, uh, I don't end up writing something that, um, you know, a reader with, with a more comprehensive knowledge, you know, would, would read and say, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense at all. That's the, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. readers are, uh, boy, it, historical fiction readers, especially, and they tend to really be sticklers about the history, but um, readers will, will come to you and they'll take you on mm. and often they have a point even if if they're not quite coming at it um i, I guess the way you intended them to if that makes sense it, it, even if they sort of misunderstand my motives let's say in something they almost always at least have a point and so you know i i, I mean some of the some of the, the most interesting commentary on my work, I think, has been from from people who um, who take me on about something, even if I stand by what I wrote and say, no, 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 that's that's not right. You're you're either I think misinterpreting history or misinterpreting a character, but it it always teaches me something and it always helps me look at it from a different perspective. It's it's. Uh, Again, going back to our science metaphor, it's 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 kind of like a peer review process, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But what about when you're trying to write a character that is very much different from you? Like, for example, let let's say I don't know if that's the case or not, but let's say that uh, a male character is the most different from you possible just because he's a male and you're a female and there are particular aspects of male psychology that you don't experience directly i i, I mean it doesn't even matter if they are innate or the result of socialization because even if they're the result of socialization there are still those differences and things like that females experience that males don't and vice versa and there are even basic stuff of uh, having to do with sex and reproduction that are very much different for males and females but particularly the the psychological aspects i mean how do you go about it because i, I i'm not sure if statistically this is true or not but uh, from what i've read i mean it's it's very common for when, for example, male writers write female characters for some females to complain that uh, they're, they are very simplistic characters, they are one-dimensional, and that are, there are aspects that they don't, identify, they don't identify with, and they say that it's because a male is writing about them or something like that. But I don't know if there's uh, males out there complaining about uh, the, the same sort of issue when it's female writers writing about male characters. I don't know, I, perhaps it's more common, uh, perhaps the first example, female uh, readers complaining about male characters is more common because females consume, uh, women consume more fiction than men. But uh, I, I, you, I, I, yeah, it's like 80, it's, it's an astounding number. It's something like 80% of all fiction readers right now are women, which mm. I think is a travesty. Yeah, but uh, going back to my original but, question, yes. how do you go about writing characters that 
at least you have a sense that they would be psychologically very different from you, at least in certain aspects. Well, I, I'll, I will um, definitely address that, but I also want to address the sort of male-female um, aspect of this that you were just that you were just talking about. Because funny you should say that. I was just writing about this on my blog. Um, I. I've had really great feedback from men. I mean, only like I, I probably have a higher percentage of men um, who are readers than most. It, it, I think it, it, it used to be higher in terms of um, like I used to have more of a 50 50 split when I was strictly uh, like a historical thriller writer. But now that I've started um, writing in this historical fantasy series, I've just had a, a greater influx of women. Um, as my readers, so now I think the split is something like 70-30, but still it's like a solid 30% of my readers are men. And I, by far, I correspond with the men um, who are my readers more than the women, not because the women don't write in, <clears throat> they do they write into my blog or they answer my newsletter. I have a newsletter. I have like, I have like close to close to 15,000 people on my newsletter. And, um, but you know, it's, it's always been so interesting to me that, um, it's the men who write in talking about history, talking about faith, talking about love and in this very detailed manner. And, you know, it, I I have, um, I mean, I do write, uh, I'm kind of pen pals with some of the women um, who uh, who follow my newsletter or my blog or whatever, and, and some I've actually feel like are, are my friends, you know, I mean, I have, I have real connections with these people, but it's, but uh -huh. even though only 30% of my readers are male, I would say 70% of the people who write to me and write to me in detail are men. But do, do you think that that could be because they would feel more at ease expressing their feelings about a particular topic, for example, that you explore in one of your books or one of your blog posts, because you're female than they would be if they were to do it with their, for example, their male friends or? For, for sure. And also, you know, they can, I think they can tell me their love story and they never have to speak to me again. They never have to see me. Maybe that's part of it. Mm. But, but what's interesting for me as a writer is being privy to their intimate thoughts. Mm. You know, that's a whole focus group for me. And it has really informed the way I write my male characters mm -hmm. and the way they interact with my female characters. And, um, and I've had really good feedback from male readers saying I, I related to this, you know, I, I, I thought it was really interesting the way you posited this, the way you, 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 um, wrote this scene with this particular male character I related, you know, and mm -hmm. so I think, I think I, I um, I hope that I do a pretty good job of that, but it's all because of my male readers. I'm so grateful for that because I think that, uh, first of all, they've also helped me understand the men in my life better, which is really great. Um, and I, I'm also a woman who has really close, close relationships with the men in my life. I've always gotten along really well with men. And maybe it's because I was close to my grandfather. I was close to my brother, you know, I, and so I feel comfortable in that space. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and yeah, and, and I suppose I, I do apply that then to, um, to writing about people who are not like me. I mean, but I also, uh, I don't do too, too, too much research either because then you can get in the weeds and it takes the magic out of what you're writing. There has to be a certain alchemy to it, I think, in order, at least for me, in order for uh, 
for the words to feel light on the page, if that makes sense, and not be too bogged down with, oh, but can he say that? Oh, I don't know if he should say that. Because, um, you know, at some point after either doing your initial research or thinking about a certain character who might be very different from you at great length, you have to let that character be themselves. Mm -hmm. And you have to let go of the facts. You have to let go of the material that has grounded you in the character and you have to let that character become his or her own um, person. And without that, I think characters fall flat. I, I feel like I can, I can always tell when um, a book has been, a fiction book has been too exhaustively researched. You know, I, I, I joined a book club recently, a few months ago, because I just wanted to force myself to read outside of what I have to read for what I do, you know, for work, for, for yeah. writing. I, I wanted to read something someone else prescribed to me and said, okay, this is the book we're reading this month. And then, and then talk about it. And, um, what, what was interesting, at least about the, the, there, there were a couple, you know, the first couple of books that we read, um, I really didn't enjoy them at all <laughs> and <laughs> they were fiction. And, you know, I, I didn't want to say anything, you know, we were, but I, I kind of got the feeling that a lot of the women in the group didn't enjoy them either. And then once we started talking about them, um, everyone admitted that they didn't enjoy them. And we were all sort of discussing how hard it is to find a good book these days. And that, mm -hmm. um, you know, even the books that are reviewed so well, uh, you know, we sit down and we read them and they're just not that great. And part of it is like, you know, that there are, I think a lot of, a lot of it is so, it sounds like reportage. And, you know, I, I think Jonathan Franzen, maybe with the corrections made that a trend, you know, 20 years ago, whenever it was that the corrections came out, maybe it was longer than that. But it's, that's a really hard thing to get right. It's really hard to make fiction that sounds like reportage, but have it be engaging and good. And a lot of times you read these books and the story is interesting, it, but it, but there's no magic. And I think probably part of that is that the editorial process isn't what it used to be inside um, the sort the sort of larger traditional publishing houses. And I think that's probably different in some of the indi independent presses, but um, there just isn't that relationship anymore between the editor and the writer where um, the writer can be kind of elevated and brought up yeah. and helped along. Um, but Anyway, getting back to what what we were talking about originally um, in terms of research, I, you know, on one hand, research is is a great tool. I, I wouldn't say it's necessary because I think that there are, are lots of people who, you know, who, who have written beautifully, who have done it through their own empathy, not even their own experience, but just their own empathy. Um, that's part of the art. But you know, at the same time, I, I think it's, I think it's really common, especially, well, I'm not going to say especially now because that might not be true, but it's, I think it's common to let too much research bog down your work. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, of course, perhaps there's when people male or female complain about characters, from their own sex, sometimes they perhaps are also making a wrong assumption that is that all men and all women are the same. I mean, there's lots, exactly. of, there's lots of variability among men and women in, Huge. in, in all traits. I mean, there are, there are men that are 
much more feminine others that are very much masculine masculine women feminine yeah. women and i mean then you can also add personality traits that vary a lot between individuals uh, unique life experiences so i mean if you're if you're like complaining that a particular male or female character doesn't ring true when it comes to representing what a man or women or a man or woman would be like or would think like or how they would react to a particular situation i guess that's just silly because it's not that all men or all women would behave or react or think the same <laughs> so right no and i i think that when you get the human element right you can dial up or dial down the personality traits whether that be dialing up masculinity or femininity or particular um proclivities interests whatever that is but i think that as long as a writer gets the human element right mm -hmm. gets the core motivations of what you know the, what motivates all of us you know the, the the basic elements of who we are and then I think a character will largely ring true mm -hmm. because you can't, it's, it's really hard to, um, to argue that someone does not want to be a coward, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's something that, um, who, who feels good about a situation where they feel like they didn't stand up? you know, where they didn't tell the truth, where they didn't do, you know, what they would like to think of themselves doing. Nobody, there is not a person alive who would feel good about a situation where they um, ran away from a responsibility, for instance. Might feel good in the immediate, right? Mm -hmm. But it haunts you. And, um, <clears throat> you know, some, Similarly, I think, you know, most people are motivated by a desire to love and be loved. Now, that could, that can take a whole lot of different forms, right? I mean, that could be a relationship with a sibling. You know, it doesn't just have to be a relationship with another lover. Um, but, but most people want a lover, too. Mm. You know, even if it's just for a brief period of time, even if it's just for that initial euphoric few months and then it falls apart or the opposite. You know, there are people who run from that feeling and they do not want to fall in love. What they want is something stable mm -hmm. that they can rely on. And um, if you know, th this is the person who will break up the, with a person that they're in love with and go and marry someone who they're clearly not in love with. You know, I think many of us have seen that happen, right? Mm -hmm. Where we've, we've watched one of our friends or someone we know, you know, not take that risk and then find themselves in a, in a, a, a stable, but maybe less than optimal situation, you know, and watching that play out is very interesting over 10, 20 years. Yeah. And, and um, then, and then of course you also have like what you could say are some outliers. Like for example, if you wanted to write a story that really portrayed, portrayed uh, well, um, a psychopath, then yeah. let, let's say, for example, because psychopaths are like at most 1% of the population, so they are really outliers. Uh, let's say that, for example, Dostoevsky, when he wrote Crime and Punishment, he, he decided to write Raskolnikov as a psychopath. I, I mean, uh, to, uh, to perhaps 
two things would happen. The first one is that the story would be much less interesting because he wouldn't feel guilt, he wouldn't turn himself in, so he would just kill the old lady and it would end there, basically, right? Yeah. And he would get off with it. So, um, but, but then on the other hand, perhaps people who are themselves psychopaths would uh, think that uh, I mean, if the character was written as a psychopath, that they would thought it was it really was more realistic that way. But just that one percent of outlier people. So I, I mean, it probably wouldn't be a compelling story for ninety nine percent of people, but perhaps that one percent of people would find it more realistic i don't know if they would find it more interesting or not but perhaps more realistic at least perhaps i mean that's a really interesting thing to contemplate too when you have a character who is only one percent of the population you know and how that yeah. person um behaves with the rest of the 99 percent of us you know um and you're right, that's, I mean, that's tricky. But in, in a way, when you're writing a psychopath, because there is so much, there's such a trope now around that, you know, with Hannibal Lecter and, and, um, and we have been immersed in stories about serial killers with both true crime and fiction. I think that now there is such a, it, it's become such an established trope that at least in genre fiction, you have, you have quite a bit of leeway to just write a psychopathic character as a, as a as a stereotype basically it's not that's not so interesting to me <laughs> but um, yeah but many of them yeah. turn out to be like caricatures of psychopaths that's it it's not that interesting i i mean it's I, if i were writing a psychopath i think i'd want to focus on a very narrow and particular um, aspect of their personality, like lying, for instance, and what lying is to that person, what it means to their existence, how everything they say is a lie, and how that affects not only them, but everyone around them, and maybe never even have them kill anyone. Yeah, just, I, I mean, I mean, most psychopaths. You know, not are, all psychopaths are killers. Exactly. No, mo most just of them are aren't even killers. Yeah. Um, and you know how, and that would be. I mean, as, at least as a as as a person and as a writer, that would be interesting to me. Watching this person in, um, just go through their lives and and focusing on on this one aspect of how how they're able to um to fit in when they know they're not like the rest of us yeah you, you know you know something i i've become I, I am very much fed up with in recent fiction in movies and more particularly in superhero movies i mean like for example the recent yeah. Batman movies and stuff like that. I mean, I, I'm just fed up with this trend of the stories having to be uh, gritty or more realistic, or for example, the villains having to have a, uh, a very dramatic uh, background. Or right, origin like. story that yeah, were, origin were so they were beaten and treated horribly. Uh, and, and this I, I, is I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. come on, just looking back at the 90s and uh, movies yeah. like Batman Forever with that silly Riddler played by Jim Carrey. I mean, he was yeah. just goofy and all of that. And I mean, why not? It's still a very interesting villain. I mean, of course, the movie is not very good. I mean, it's, <laughs> the, the, to, be, to be honest, at least in my opinion. But the the Jim Carrey Riddler character is still very interesting and if it was developed a little if he was developed a little bit more perhaps it would make for a great a great character I mean why do they 
why do these characters have to be, particularly the villains, so serious? Why do they have to take themselves so seriously? I mean, why they can't they just be laughing and goofing around a little bit and just playing and just be a little bit more playful? Why do they have to be so, I don't know, <laughs> under the weather all the time or something like that? I agree. I, I think that um, I think that's part of why I find a lot of fiction a real drag right now, um, if I can use a 1970s term. <laughs> but um, but it it does it is a that's that seems like the perfect description for me. It's a drag. It drags you down. There's no levity in it, and I think that even in the most serious drama about the most serious topic. There can be an element of humor, of dark humor maybe, but it's what gets us through really difficult times. I mean, I can't think of a time that I went through that that um, that was really difficult, you know, really heart-wrenching, um, epic, and it was a saga in and of itself that I didn't get through by using humor. And sometimes just saying really inappropriate things just to just to add some lightness just to be able to laugh at myself and laugh at the situation and that i think i think there's a real fear of putting humor into anything that's serious because just you know the current uh that's not funny, young lady, <laughs> if I can quote um, Sister Margaret Ann, who used to say that to me all the time, right, in Catholic school. But there, there's a whole, that's not funny. You shouldn't be laughing at that kind of um, ethos right now, which I, I, I don't think it's conducive to very good art. I don't think it's conducive to, to understanding ourselves or each other. And you know, even <laughs> you really, you really nailed it. Even in like the superhero genre, which is by nature a sort of silly supernatural drama. I, I mean, it has to I, be silly because the, the, those kinds of people do not exist, uh, and that's it. So. it. Yeah, and the thing is, if you have a brooding Batman, and then all the villains are brooding too. Come on. I mean, one of the things that I thought really worked, um, at, at least with the the Batman franchises, um, when the uh, villains were more silly, is because Batman was serious and took himself seriously, and, oh, you know, his parents were dead, and, you know, he had this backstory, but he was this rich guy, and he was going to go fight crime on, um, on the side. It worked to have the villains be ridiculous because they were mocking him, you know? Yeah, and, and, and not only that, uh, of course, I don't think that in in the more older uh, Batman movies they ever achieved that. But if you write a sillier villain, perhaps even someone who's a little bit nihilistic, but uh, I mean, just someone who doesn't care very much about anything at all, but just wants to laugh a little bit and have a good time, something like that, whatever a good time might mean in that particular case. Um, I mean, it, it can be, it can, if it's really well written, it can be even scarier because, I mean, you have in front of you someone who doesn't care at all about anything. And these more recent villains are all, they seem to all be on uh, some sort of moral crusade or something like that. They are very much more realistic and all of that kind of thing. That's... Oh, I, I went through these experiences and I, when I was a child and now I am uh, revolting against the world and I'm on the right and uh, come on. Come on, you, you can just be silly and don't care much at all about anything, and that makes for a good villain if it's written well. Yes, and I, I mean, I think that what what worked in the sort of original, you know, superhero universes, right, is the fact that you know the heroes tended to take society and order very seriously. 
and they took their um, their responsibilities very seriously. And the whole point was that the villains were making a mockery of that, and they were trying to tear down mm -hmm. in this sort of nihilistic way. It was fighting that nihilism. And then if you so, like you said, if you've got then both your hero and your villains are sort of nihilistic and are having an existential crisis and can't figure out if they're good or bad, yeah. then it, it, it's not as interesting. And it, it just doesn't take a stand about anything. Mm. It doesn't allow you to figure out where you, you know, where you are on, um, on the spectrum, let's put it that way. Um, okay, so so give perhaps... you a root for either. It doesn't give you anything to root for as a as a viewer or as a reader or or you know it, you're just watching this mess in front of you basically. Right. Yeah, so so perhaps a character that goes more along the lines of what I'm talking about would be the um, Dark Knight Joker, the Joker from 2008. I mean mm -hmm. that that Joker was much more silly and mm -hmm. uh, goofy and uh, of course of course he killed people and all of that and uh, right. but but i mean it was just that he had that sort of mentality that he didn't really care much about anything i mean he mm -hmm. just wanted to do whatever came to his mind on the moment and of course he, uh, he also planned ahead a little bit but just i mean he was just or it just sounded more playful than these more recent villains. So. Impulsivity run amok, yeah. you know. Immaturity run amok, you know. Yeah. These are these are the sort of archetypes that we're looking at, right? And it, it does. It kind of shows you in the most. It it takes you the worst absolute possible outcome of someone who refuses to take on any adult responsibility. I mean, in that case, I think, mm -hmm. you know, who stays in that place of mocking everything, of, of not taking anything seriously, even life and death. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, taking that character all the way to its absolute worst conclusion, I think that's interesting and terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, and and I mean, I guess that's also why. I mean, I would imagine that uh, that specific character uh, character is called the Joker. I mean, because it's yeah. about it's about joking about serious stuff. I mean, it doesn't take yeah. it doesn't uh, particularly when it comes to moral issues. It doesn't take them seriously at all. So no. So, no, it, rem it, it, it reminds me of, um, my brother and I were talking, actually, we were talking about um, Ted Bundy. Mm -hmm. And he, he said how Ted Bundy was really proud of the fact that he knew the difference between right and wrong. And he was being interviewed by a psychologist, you know, when he was already in prison, obviously. And he, and he was really proud of that. He was like, I know the difference between right and wrong. And he said, for instance, I know that um, jaywalking is wrong. It's against the law. And I know that killing someone is wrong. And my brother said, and what's, you know, what's critical about that is that he equates jaywalking to murder. To him, they're the same. Mm. Right? Yeah. And, you know, that that reminds me of what, you know, what we were just talking about. Someone like the Joker mm -hmm. who makes light of everything. Right. Um, he will equate, um, you know, throwing a rotten tomato at a at, at somebody who who is annoying, you know, on the stage to throwing a grenade at that person. Yeah. And um, well, that's what's really terrifying. And I don't see how somebody brooding and existential can really get to that terrifying place because you're too busy. He's too busy feeling sorry for himself. Yeah. And then we're too busy kind of struggling with 
whether we feel sorry for him, you know, and, and I think that, um, you know, yeah, and I guess that someone who ruminates a lot is not very interesting. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I ha action is interesting. Yeah. That doesn't mean that there's no place for rumination, obviously. I mean, it's, 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 that can be interesting in spurts, but you just can't, I, to me, I don't think a villain that just spends all of their time ruminating and less mm -hmm. of their time acting is that interesting. And they're definitely not that scary and threatening. Yeah. Okay, uh, so look, uh, a character that for me is very boring, not so much in the books, but particularly in the TV series, and many people think the same, and I get why uh, Stan is Baratheon from Game of Thrones, the one who, who killed uh, his child mm -hmm. and was with that red which or right, whatever. right, right, right. Uh, I, I mean, I mean his that daughter uh, at the stake has like yeah, uh, his daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, of course, he had his role to play in the story, but he was very much a boring person. I mean, because he he was just brooding all the time. So boring and unappealing. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and that's, I mean, boy, is he a great example of a character that just drags. Yeah. Because it's, you're watching, you know, with all of the brooding and all of that, this sort of slow devolution, you know, that, that, that's inevitable. With I, I mean, I mean, but I, it's I, not I don't that know. interesting. I mean, the most interesting he did, thing he did was burn his daughter at the stake, which was horrifying. I, I mean, I don't know if they, if they did that on purpose, if they really wanted to characterize him that way as a very boring person. But, but there's even yeah. that scene, there's even that scene uh, where he was with the Night's Watch and with Davos next to him. And there's someone saying, someone <clears> said, <throat> less people and he was like it's not less it's fewer i mean that's the the yeah, extreme the, that's so the true. extreme the extreme characterization of a boring person someone who someone who even corrects you grammatically when you're speaking so. uh, oh my god yes i feel like that's a lot of our public discourse right now <laughs> a lot of nitpicking yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if if someone is saying something interesting, who cares if she messes up a little bit and says less people instead of fewer? I mean, who cares? Yeah. Who cares that's, about that's besides it? the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but that that's the sort of thing he was focused on. So, yeah. I know, and and the most interesting conclusion of that is that he he shouldn't be king. <laughs> You're not rooting for him to be king at all because a king cannot be concerning himself with whether it's less or fewer. Yeah, I mean, with that guy... No won't... wonder he needed the witch to tell him what to do. Yeah. He couldn't make any decisions on his own. He couldn't even decide. He couldn't even say, no, I'm not going to burn my daughter at the stake. Yeah. No, but I, I mean, I'm very much fed up with this recent trend of I mean, writing what are supposedly more realistic uh, superheroes and supervillains or whatever. I mean, it's for me, it's, it, it has just become boring at this point. I, I, I don't, to tell you the truth, I don't even know that they are more realistic. Yeah. Um, I think that they're more a reflection of, look, if you're writing a villain that um, instead of simply um, rationalizing all of their actions, which is what most criminals do, at least according to my brother, right? <laughs> um, then I, 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 that seems to me to just if, if you're sitting there having an existential crisis all the time, that seems to be more of a reflection of the writer's own psyche and neuroses than the actual villain. It's, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because I, you know, getting back to, you know, having 
we're talking about a villain and then this is this is a real villain right i was talking um to my brother again about um a criminal that uh a murderer who um was on death row that he knew and uh, what my brother found interesting about him was actually that he did have a conscience and, mm -hmm. and because most of them really don't um most are able to totally rationalize what they've done but here we're talking about but people this specific we're, we're talking about a specific um man on death row that my brother knew and he said okay. you know I, I i i liked him because he actually did have a conscience and he he had to and and the way that was expressed was that he had to come up with a, you know an he was convinced that kind of an alternative personality uh, inhabited him and his spirit when he um, committed his crimes. So I think they were gang related crimes. And so he was kind of pushed to, to do this, you know, to, to do some of these really awful things and, and kill people. But he himself would not have gone out on his own and done this. And the way he was able to to do it was um, to be like basically possessed, to feel that he was possessed while he did it. Mm. And so, you know, that's to me that that seems more realistic, and that's that's not having an existential crisis. That is saying, well, it wasn't me. You know what I mean? I was I, I was possessed by this spirit and that's you know i would have never done something so horrible i, I just wouldn't have done it you know and th that just seems to me a little bit more realistic than someone going oh i just don't know if i should kill all these people but i guess i'm gonna have to do it because i was abused or whatever the reason <laughs> is you know what i mean and um, I don't know, I suppose maybe it's been interesting for us to, to consider that point of view for a time, but I, I, but I think that it's, it's time to move away from that because it really has not, um, uh, I think it has not produced the insights or even the empathy that we're, we've been hoping for. And it has certainly made it more difficult for us to be able to make moral choices, which yeah. I think we have to do as people and as writers, you know, I think we have to make moral choices because for one, I mean, as a writer, it's just not interesting unless you're making moral choices. Yeah. It's like Stannis Baratheon. It's not interesting to watch someone dither. Mm -hmm. um, but also ultimately that is our responsibility as human beings. We have a responsibility to the moral law. We have a responsibility to truth. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is reflected in really good fiction. Yeah. No, no you, you know, I think that by this point, what would make for a, a great movie would be a satire about these <laughs> recent superheroes, uh, superhero movies, like uh, that sort of is exaggerated thing about someone, a villain who has a dreadful childhood and then is like, oh no, yeah, I, exactly. I have to kill all these people because I can't bear the pain. I don't want to, but I have to. And then he pushes and then Exactly. And, 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 and start so stabbing so everyone in the, in the bakery or something like that. <laughs> I mean, I get. I think that would be a great movie. I mean, someone should do, uh, should do should satirize this. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Beca because it, it, <laughs> because if you, it, because if you just uh, distance yourself a little bit from the darkness of the story. I mean, it's it's silly. It's really silly. Their motives for doing what they're doing are silly. I mean, they're justifying extreme criminal behavior just because they went through some things that lots of people, people go through. I mean, yeah. really, who? Yeah. 
<laughs> so, th it's, the, it's, it's actually, it's so funny because it's actually the minority of people who have not been through uh, something significant in their lives, certainly yeah. by the time they reach adulthood, proper adulthood, you know, even if they had an idyllic childhood, you know, something's going to get you. <laughs> Something is going to uh, cause you to have, lose faith to, you know, be in a tremendous amount of pain. Something's going to cause you to maybe make a horrible mistake that you regret for the rest of your life and that you have to come to terms with. Yeah. Um, or someone's going to hurt you. This is simply part of being human. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And also, I, I, I mean, I'm ready for this. I'm ready for this to move on. I'm ready for us to go back to um, having to make decisions about having to make consequential decisions about morality mm. and about what motivates us. I think that's all we can do as human beings. Yeah, and also, I mean the. And I think we were all already touching on this issue earlier, but also this idea that just because these movies are darker and grittier, they are more realistic. I mean, or deeper what, somehow. Yeah, but but <laughs> you know? why? Why? I mean, you know what would be a realistic piece of art? It would be some, particularly a book or a movie. It would be something. <laughs> absolutely boring because you would have people do absolutely boring things that's mo most of reality uh, saying absolutely boring things uh, and uh, I mean even the dialogues with would be most of the time mm, uh, mm, and then pauses and what <laughs> I mean that would be realistic but that would be extremely boring Absolutely. You know, it's funny. We're talking about superheroes. Have you heard of the the series The Boys? Yeah. Yeah. Have you watched it? Uh, just the first two seasons. Okay. I have not even gotten that far. I've seen maybe four episodes. Yeah. And I and I watch them like really like right after one another, mm -hmm. and. At first, I was like, oh, this is really funny. But it was interesting because by about the fourth episode, I was bored. I was starting to get really bored by these people. No. I, it's just, I think if we followed, for instance, Charlie Sheen around with a camera, I think it would be interesting for about the first day, right? <laughs> After that, you're like, oh, God, another orgy? Oh, for God's sake, this is boring, you know, and I think I was having the same feeling about that. And um, no, no, but I get you. I get you. I mean, I managed yeah. to watch the first two seasons entirely, but I'm not I'm not watching it anymore. I, I mean, I, it, by now, it's unbearable for me. I, yeah, I, I, that's it. And the thing is, the whole what's what's interesting is is. I don't know. I, I, if both the bad guys and the good guys are bad, then what? You know, then what are we watching? There's no struggle. You know, yeah, but, but that's what I'm saying. If, I, I, I mean, at a certain point, I, I'm not even sure if uh, if that's meant to be taken seriously or if it's satire. I'm not yeah. sure anymore. But I mean, if, if, it, if it's satire, it, it's it's not done well because uh, I, it, because yeah. if it's satire, you would know immediately it's satire. But you're not sure there. No. It's uh, the boring nature of nihilism. It's it's it just seems like have you watched or read the Watchmen? by Ellen Moore. Mm -mm. Yeah, it's a comic book and a movie from 2009, I think. 
Uh, I mean, the the boys for me, it's like the Watchmen on steroids because it's it's like um, coming up with superheroes and then they're just completely messed up and now they're going to use and abuse their superpowers just for their own personal just for the fun of it yeah 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 just for the fun of it or just for to serve their own personal interests and i mean it, it, interestingly enough it, even alan moore himself uh, after he published the watchman uh, i'm not sure where i read this or perhaps i watched it somewhere but he said that uh, he regretted writing that comic because superhero comics were not supposed to be that way. They were supposed to be silly. So <laughs> I like him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A and he was the author. And he said that he thought he made a mistake. So and and it was extremely popular. I mean, and even in the movie as well. So well, maybe I'll check it out just just for fun. No, you you have to check it out, and then you perhaps I will try to find where Ellen Moore said that because it's it's very interesting. If you know the comic and or the movie, and then you um, read or watch his interview, it's a very interesting piece of. Uh, the history of art or something like that. So. What if you, have you been watching or reading anything that that has compelled you lately, or, um, or do you find yourself in a drought? Uh, well, I'm. I, I I always find interesting stuff to read, mostly because I I read many things from Japan, particularly yeah. Jap Japanese manga, and I mean they. Uh, their stories are all over so the good. place, all, all over the place. Yeah. So you always find something interesting and refreshing to, to read that's very different from everything you ever read, even if you're a heavy reader. But yeah. Um, well, the, <laughs> the, there's, a, a, there's a manga that I'm all, almost finishing now, Assassination Classroom. That's like a, there are parts of it that are more serious, but much of it is goofy. And then the plot is very, very interesting. It's basically um, a classroom of middle schoolers who have a teacher that's basically... Uh, okay, so I don't want to spoil the end, but at the beginning of the story, what you know is that he, it is... It, he, she, I don't know what to call it, but it's, it's basically, a, it seems like an alien. It seems, it seems like a, an octopus. He, he has tentacles and he's yellow and he's goofy and all of that. But, they, but the, the point is that they're in a classroom where they're, they're being trained as hitmen because they have to kill him otherwise in nine months or so uh, because he's like a ticking time bomb he he will destroy the earth and then oh you God. and then you and then you get to know why you get to know his background story but but basically what's interesting what's the most interesting part about it for me is that the plot initially sounds very sounds ridiculous sounds absolutely silly i mean why why would you put uh, a ticking time bomb uh, suppose daily in the west ultimate destructive powers like to cause an enough to cause an apocalypse on earth that is going to destroy the earth in nine months in a classroom teaching middle schoolers and <laughs> having and train them as hitmen to kill him why why it's absolutely ridiculous but then uh, as you move along interestingly enough they learn some very important uh, very they learn some very important lessons in life by going through that process so. see this is what's so fantastic. And, 
And I wish that the this sort of spirit of manga would infect the storytelling process um, here, you know, in the West, let's say, or in the wherever. But um, I, I would like to see it, it, it to see that spirit um, infect our cu cultural conversation and our fiction, because that's what it's about. It's about creating a pressure cooker. It's about creating a really interesting set of circumstances and then watching what we learn from it, how we behave and the decisions that we need to make in order to, well, in this case, save the world, mm -hmm. which is about as big a decision as you would have to make. Right, yeah, and, and the, and big the... a task, a quest, as you could possibly be given to save the world, and I, you know this is this is the stuff that I like to do in my own fiction because it's otherwise if you're not saving the world or something like that, or if if the stakes aren't big enough, what are you learning, and? what's really deeply humanly interesting about it. You know, I think that when you make the stakes big enough, like you have a yellow octopus creature that's gonna explode and you have a bunch of middle schoolers that have to take it out and have to learn over nine months how to, how to take this creature out. Um, that I think, <laughs> a situation like that really gets to the core truths, doesn't it? It really forces you to ponder what matters and why yeah and and by the way one of the most interesting aspects of the plot that i don't think i mentioned is that uh, that octopus is the is their teacher so <laughs> so, so they're so they're gonna have to murder their teacher who they're learning from and who they develop a real relationship with yeah well, that's, I mean, that's also incredible because it, that's, isn't that what growing up means? Yeah. And, and, I mean, but, and literally, basically, obviously, we don't murder our parents, we don't murder our mentors and our teachers, but we're meant to surpass them, to move beyond them, to go off and do our own thing. Yeah. And not um, stay chained to, you know, our parents and mentors and such uh and and dependent upon them emotionally in every way yeah exactly what a great metaphor yeah what exactly. a great metaphor and, and then there's all the silliness associated with it i mean you just think okay so why would someone let uh, a murderous machine teach their children but the <laughs> thing is that that no one can kill him because he's so strong and he moves at Mac 20 that is like the speed of sound and something and and he uses several different tentacles so I mean it's just silly but it's uh, it's great it's great it sounds fantastic yeah <laughs> so and, and then also the idea of okay instead of having your professional hitman trying to kill the octopus you just train middle schoolers <laughs> to do well, it <laughs> the genius of that too because middle schoolers are so evil have you um have have you heard of this series it's it's probably about 15 years old now it's called diary of a wimpy kid uh i've heard about i've heard of it but i because it was made into a movie the movies are complete crap. Um, but I, I read it because my, it was what my, got my son interested in reading because he was not a reader until he found Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And it's, it's interesting because it's, it really is like it's in diary format and there are little stick figures drawn in it. You know, that's the art that goes with it. And what's so brilliant about it, the books, not the movie, the movie took all the teeth out of the books the way they love to do that. But it really shows what shits middle, middle schoolers are. And yet you have a real empathy for them too. You know, it, 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 it the, um, the author is just brilliant at letting these characters do what they will do. Um, 
betray their friends and then try to like worm their way back into into their good graces because um that friend like you know takes them to the lake in every summer because the parents are richer than his you know it's just stuff like that where um where these middle schoolers are just constantly doing these terrible things to each other and then making up and breaking up and 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 learning from what they're doing, but not really, you know, and, and um, it's, it's just fantastic. Now, what really was terrible about the movies is, is that they, um, they tried to tug at your heartstrings. Mm. And they, they tried too hard to make the characters actually learn from their experience. And everybody had a big hug after, you know, at the end, it was one of those kinds of situations, where it's like, no, you completely destroyed the entire point of this series. The entire point is it's middle school forever because the kid never gets out of middle school. It's meant to stay in middle school and is dealing with with middle school politics um, perpetually, you know, in this series. And there yeah. is no uh, hug at the end. There is no, um, Oh, shucks, you know, we're going to be besties now. We've, we've, we've worked through our differences. No, they never work through their differences and mm -hmm. they're not supposed to. And, um, anyway, th that's about the, that's about the closest <laughs> that I can think of, especially, um, in what's being written for, for young people, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, but when it comes, it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, when it comes to these assassination classroom manga, one of the most interesting things about it is that, and I mean, this would make many people absolutely mad if, yeah. if they read the manga, but one of the most interesting things is that they learn important life lessons while being trained to kill. Yes. Yeah. And, and I mean, and the twist there is that they are trained to kill with weapons that only hurt uh, their teacher. They don't hurt humans. So that's really interesting, too. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Um, I, yeah, I mean, we're, talk, to, we're talking about like taking the teeth out of things and making th everything an existential crisis. Um, I think in. in in all of this with, you know, having sensitivity readers, you know what a sensitivity reader is. I think that we talked about it mm -hmm. once. Yeah. In yeah. having sensitivity readers and in being afraid that something's going to trigger someone and, um, it, you know, taking, taking anything really that makes you think and that's interesting out of mm -hmm. a story. You know, you have to have someone make mistakes and say something awful, do something awful in order to be able to learn something from it. And you don't have to make that person a terrible villain. You can make them human, for heaven's sake. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that it, 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 it doesn't allow us then that the satisfaction of that learning process, you know, and I love the... I, I love the metaphor of them having to kill their teacher and <laughs> with weapons that can only kill that teacher and that um, this is how they're being, this is how they're growing up in their middle years, you know, in their middle school years when they're 11, 12, 13 years old. Um, it's, it, that's a fantastic metaphor for that time in your life yeah. because you are in essence being taught that, aren't you? You know, you are being taught mm -hmm. how to kill and how to kill ethically. Yeah, and uh, I mean the, all of that. Really, but you know, you're 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 being taught how to advocate for yourself. Let's put it that way. And sometimes, mm -hmm. in having to advocate for yourself, you have to do something that's unpleasant and mm -hmm. that that feels uh, harsh. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and I mean all that the recent talk about trauma and trigger warnings and everybody being traumatized all the time with uh, even the smallest things. I mean, I might be biased, but all the people I know are much more resilient than that. I mean, there are even some people out there that go through stuff that are horrifying 
uh, and they, I mean, they're just fine after that. I, I can safely say that I don't know anyone who is so fragile that they can't um, <clears throat> read about history, for instance, and take it in context. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I have to think that those people, first of all, if there is someone who is that fragile, I think that they, I think that they have much deeper problems that, mm -hmm. that maybe need to be addressed, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I, like you, I don't personally know anyone like that. I feel like they're a myth out there, all these people who are being triggered. Mm -hmm. And that, um, I mean, I don't know, maybe that they exist in reality on, um, on Twitter, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or <clears throat> yeah. on college campuses, you know, when, when, young people are, are really kind of absorbing, you know, all becoming an adult, you know, and, and all of these things that we're talking about where they're, they're, they're trying to understand how to behave in the world and, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe get, get a bit dramatic. Um, but I, I, like you, I just don't think those people really exist in any reasonable um yeah and i mean i think that of course there are things that are very much traumatic like for example course. one obvious example is going through war or something like that yeah. of, of course that's uh, that can be extremely traumatic but i mean i guess that for like 99 percent of the problems people go through in life if they uh, if they make lots of drama out of them i mean it's because of lack of experience because eventually people just find out that for most issues they have to deal with they're not that big of a deal so no and you manage to get through them even if they are something that's really terrifying you most of the time you get through it yeah. And you get through it with a lot more strength than you realize. And you, that actually teaches you something about yourself. And it's, there's a certain kind of, there's a certain exhilaration <laughs> that you feel um, it, when you've gotten through something that's really harrowing, that's very mm -hmm. difficult, that, it, that could be anything from, you know, a, a divorce or a terrible breakup to yeah. the loss of someone close to you, the loss of a career um you know really serious financial troubles really serious illness all of these things um when you get through them you feel a certain sense of superhuman you know a certain sort of superhuman sense about yourself you're like oh my god i i actually made it through that and not only did i make it through on the other side i'm okay mm. i'm not you know clawing at my skin and now you know what did they say in the bible and there was much um there was much shouting and gnashing of the teeth or something like that that they say whenever someone really gets um gets busted for doing uh what they're not supposed to do um but you know even even when one makes a, a real mistake in life, let's say, something that they consider a mistake and, and has a real regret um, about either an opportunity they did or did not take or the way they treated someone. Um, that is such a, an important thing to go through. You know, if you've said something that hurt someone, it shouldn't, you shouldn't just be banished for heaven's sake. We should all be allowed to go through that and go through that with the person and watch that, watch how that unravels. And um, there's there's just not much of an appetite for that right now, which I hope is changing. I mean, it was interesting. I was telling you about my book club and great women, by the way, and I really like them, like every single one of them and very interesting people. They're they're very um, they're great conversationalists, you know, but uh we were talking about 
um, potentially um, reading a book from, I think it's from the early 1950s. It's called A Town Like Alice, and it's marvelous. I mean, it really is a great book. It's romance, but it's, it's, a, it's a very smart romance. And it's written by a man, actually. And we were all talking about what a great book it was and that we you know we'd all like to read it together or not. We were all a couple of us. And so um, the leader of our book club sent it out, you know, and said, you know, we're thinking of reading a town like Alice. And then she added, but I, I just have to let you all know that um, there is some, uh, you know, basically she said, basically some antiquated language, probably re regarding women and race and gender, you know, all the things that, that we talk about now that, were different. We talked about differently in the early 1950s. Now I've read A Town Like Alice and I, there's really nothing in it that would be, that I would consider offensive. You just certainly take it in its historical context. But I think that maybe it it, it involved um, ter terminology, vocabulary. And so, and then it just disappeared. We were never talking about reading that book again. Because I think, I, I suspect, everyone just sort of backed off and they were like, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't read it. Yeah. And, and maybe that's not why. Maybe nobody wanted to read a book from the early 1950s and thought that was dull. I could be completely off. But um, I just think that these perpetual trigger warnings are so conversation ending. And nine out of 10 times when we actually have that conversation, we get somewhere. Sometimes it ends up just being an argument, but most of the time we get somewhere, we come to some sort of understanding and we understand ourselves better, we understand others better, and we're actually less triggered and less hurt yeah. by the situation. Yeah, and I mean, at least something <clears throat> that I, I've experienced several times in my life, sometimes having to do with me directly other times with other people is that there are times where i mean the person himself or herself doesn't really pay much attention to what happened but it's other people pitying her and uh, sort of forcing drama into her mm -hmm. life I, I, I mean it's ridiculous because the, different people deal with the same experiences in different way. And there are people for there, whom, for whom even very hard things are basically nothing. They just go through it mm -hmm. and they get to the other side and it's perfectly fine. And don't, they don't even think twice about it. Uh, and there are others who really, I mean, who really get depressed and all of that thing. But, I mean, sometimes it's the pers the people around that particular person forcing drama into her life as if she had to feel bad and sad and down because that's the appropriate response <laughs> to the well, thing that person went through. And I'm, it's ridiculous. So. Exactly. I mean, if I can, if I can kind of make an analogy to raising kids, you know, when kids are little and they have a temper tantrum or they fall down and they didn't really hurt themselves, but they fall down and they just start crying. I mean, the thing that you're, the absolute thing that you're not supposed to do is go over to them and be like, oh my God, are you all right? You know, cause that yeah. teaches them the drama that teaches them that what happened to them was horrible. When yeah. really they just fell down, you know, you go, oh, oh, yeah, that hurt. Get up, come on, let's go. How's your knee? Okay. You know, and then, you know, you acknowledge it and you move on. And that used to be common sense, but you know, we've gotten stuck in this place where, where we are over-dramatizing everything and we're not um, paying attention to our own resilience. You know, I mean, I, I have a, a, someone really close to me who's, whose mother was really awful to her. I mean, really used to say terrible, terrible things to her. And, um, you know, regardless, like basically when she was like the prom queen, her mother was like, you don't deserve it. You're nothing, you know, and her friend, her, you know, it, this happened during high school and 
she had a girlfriend over and the girlfriend heard the mother say this and was like, oh my God, I can't believe your mother would say something like that to you. And um, how could you even, you know, how can you even function? And my friend said, I don't believe it. I just don't believe her. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that just, not everybody responds to their mother saying something horrible yeah. to them. Yeah. With by completely crumbling, uh, yeah. because there are a lot of parents who have yeah. said really horrible things to yeah. their children. Sure. And and those children are now adults and they're functional adults and yeah. they don't necessarily treat their own children mm-hmm. that badly. Um. But yeah, we're not. Yeah. Yeah, we're not exploring that at all. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I mean, I really get this impression that many times it's just because people around the person can't see that reaction yeah. as normative or normal or yeah. something like that. The, if yeah. the person is not down and sad uh, and in the drain, they, I mean, they can't deal with they it. They can't wrap their heads around that. No, oh, no, 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 no. You're, de- not, you're in denial. You must be, you know, not, a, not accepting what's happened to you or, or something. You yeah. know, and, and it's interesting, too, because that seems to fly in the face of, um, well, what we've been talking about in terms of, um, I'm talking about in the greater cultural conversation in terms of what psychology is supposed to do for us. I mean, the whole point is that we're supposed to face our fears. We're supposed to face things that have happened to us and talk about them and not hide them or push them away. Um, I mean, that's sort of, I mean, isn't that kind of psychology 101? And yet here we are now in the public conversation not allowing any kind of conversation to take place that will take us, um, excuse me, somewhere uh, that could potentially hurt our feelings, not even hurt our feelings, but potentially hurt our feelings. Yeah. As uh, As if getting our feelings hurt is the worst thing that could possibly happen to us. Yeah. No, I'm just going to tell you about two different stories that that are sort of related to what we're talking about here. Just the other day, I I mean, of course, here in in Portugal, we also have that sort of uh, afternoon silly talk shows where it's all drama, it's all tragedy and horror. And I mean, you know what I'm talking about. My husband married my sister. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, but there was someone there uh, promoting a book. I don't even know her credentials. It was a woman, but they didn't even say if she was a psychologist or whatever. I don't even know. It doesn't matter. But she was promoting a book that was titled something like um, A Positive Divorce. And (laughs) at a certain point she said, oh, uh, divorce is always painful. And I was like, wait a minute. You're not going to convince me of that. If you if you just said divorce is painful, many times it's painful or it's painful for many people or perhaps I would even buy that it's painful for most people. But it, it is saying that it's always painful. I'm, I don't buy that at all. I mean, for some people, it's just a relief. <laughs> well, especially if you don't have kids, then it's just, you know what I mean? It can be a tremendous relief, I think, that you... Yeah been able to extricate yourself from this relationship without there being, you know, too many consequences for heaven's sake. Yeah. Yeah. My sister-in-law, her first husband, she said it was so, you know, they, they did not have kids together and they, they were divorced within like, I think two years of getting married when they were quite young, but she she was telling me about how she was with a friend of hers and they were walking down the street and, and, um, and her friend said, Oh my God, that was Ray her ex-husband, and my sister-in-law was like, I didn't even recognize him. <laughs> you know, so, to your point, you're right. Now, if she had ended up getting divorced to her husband now, I think that would have been a far more traumatic experience. They really yeah, love but, each other. But, but, but again, but, it depends. 
it depends, right? It depends on the person. It depends on the kind of relationship we have with the other, you have with the other person. I mean, if it's a drag, it's just a relief that you got divorced. Right? That you're out of the relationship. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it is. It's, it's so dependent upon context. And yeah. we have lost, at least in the public conversation, I don't think that we've lost it in, in our personal lives at all. But I think in the public conversation, we have removed context. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, I yeah. just, I you just know, saw... I mean, a, a great example of this, and I, I, I believe that it was AI that caught this, but I, I was, um, I might have told you this already. God, I hate, I hate repeating myself, but I'll repeat myself just in case I have it. I, I was um, banned for 24 hours on Facebook for hate speech. Mm. Now, let me tell you about the hate speech, okay? Oh, okay, I think I'm going to laugh, <laughs> but yeah. There was, you know, the Dar, like the Darwin Awards. Have you heard of the Darwin Awards? Yeah. Right, it, for those listening who don't know what the Darwin Awards are, they're, they're a, a satirical award given out to people who managed to remove themselves from the human race, in other words, die, through sheer acts of complete stupidity. Like one year, the guy who won the Darwin Awards, he put a bunch of helium balloons on his wheelchair and then lifted up into the clouds and then wanted to come down, so he starts shooting the balloons and of course, he told that it's just stuff like that, that it's, it's just like you can't believe someone would do something so silly, right? And um, so there was some kind of story like that in the news, and I posted it. Mm. And it was some guy in Florida who did something utterly ridiculous. And a friend of mine who's Canadian posted um, a story from Canada that bested me. You know, that was like, oh, no, 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 no. I've got a much better one, you know, um, and, and posted that. And I wrote, damn Canadians, like, damn, you got us again, right? And, oh, my God. Was it because of the damn Canadians? I said, damn Canadians to my Canadian friend about a joke, you know, about <laughs> a story about some some bank robber or something who did something egregiously stupid in Toronto, right? And I got banned for 24 hours from oh Facebook for hate speech. And I couldn't, um, I couldn't appeal it. They told me it was unappealable. Don't bother. Sit this one out. It was unbelievable. Complete lack of context. Now, yeah. it was probably AI that caught it. Sure. And, but the fact yeah, that you're not course. allowed to say damn Canadians, I find absurd. Because even even if the context was, I damn all of you Canadians, and I meant it seriously, I think you can say that. You know what I mean? That's I not mean, the, why, why not? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I, I don't think that that is so egregious, Yeah. an insult, that yeah. you can't say damn Canadians. But um, again, we've lost context, it seems. We've lost the ability to at least publicly to discuss context, maybe because it's too hard, because there are too many people in the public space. I, I get that. I, I, I understand that these social media companies really have a, a huge, huge job to do in terms of mm. policing the content and they can't possibly yeah. uh, get it right all the time. But, um, but it is affecting the way that we discourse you know it is affecting how um how much we allow ourselves to say uh you know even i think even among friends increasingly and i think that's a loss and it's something that we need to fight against so that we can have those conversations so that um we do have those stories with the octopus man who's going to be, <laughs> who's going to be, you know, um, killed by his students, you know, or have the equivalent of that. You know, I, I want to see those stories in fiction, even if they're not, you know, manga style, that's not appropriate for every genre, obviously, or even for literary fiction. Well, I don't necessarily think it's inappropriate, but we should be able to tackle topics as bombastically and as <sighs> ambitiously. Mm -hmm. 
um, and learn something about ourselves in the process. Yeah. The Russians always did that so well. You know, we've talked about how much we love Russian authors, Russian fiction authors, because they will go there. Mm -hmm. They just will. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and no, I mean, as I, as I say, as I always say, at least as far as I'm aware, of course, there are there certainly literature I'm not even aware of from all sorts of countries out there, but at least the literatures I know, the ones I love the most, are the Russian and the Japanese literature. So, yeah. I, I mean, because they just don't seem to care about a certain limits that perhaps people people in other cultures or countries have so yes yeah i you know with the I, I look at japan um first here's an island it's a bustling island right mm -hmm. it's 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 uh it's an economic power and um, it's also a culture that places a lot of strictures on behavior. And so mm -hmm. I, you know, it's, it, it makes sense that there would be these outlets. Yeah. And it's, that's, that's, it's really quite wonderful. Um, I don't know why the Russians are the way they are. I mean, that in and of itself, that's not as easy, I think, to, um, to name, you know, well, because it must be because of the cold. Or something I like. think it because of the cold, because of the vodka. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, but when it comes to the alcohol, I guess that everyone practically in every country has access to, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> to alcoholic <laughs> beverages. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know if it's the vodka. I, I'm not very convinced by it. So. <laughs> no, no, I um, but they, yeah, yeah. It's it's also it's it's also a uh, a part of the world where a lot has happened. Well, I mean, here in Portugal, we had Fernando Pessoa who drank a lot yes. of absinthe. So when he was uh, writing. While drinking a lot of absinthe, did you say? Yeah, that was, he was writing in the 20s, so that would make sense. Absinthe was the drink du jour for writers, right? Because that's what mm -hmm. Hemingway and his... I, I mean, he even, even, died, even died when he was 47 due to liver complications. So. Ooh. Yeah. No, he was a heavy drinker and smoker as well, so, yeah. Have you ever had absinthe? Um, I mean, just... No, I had it once, but it was just one small shot, so... It didn't even have any sort of effect. So. Me too. I found it gross. I thought found it really disgusting. <laughs> uh, and, and no, it's really hard to, to drink. <laughs> I mean, I uh, I can do it. I was in my twenties. I was living in Prague at the time, and it was uh, you know absinthe. Everyone it, it it became a trend for a short period of time there where all the bars were offering absinthe and they lighted on fire and, you know, they did the whole. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try some absinthe. Here we are. And everyone was calling Prague in the nineties that it was like Paris in the twenties. So, so we were all going to put on our, um, our Hemingway, right. Our, in, our inner Hemingway. And it was so disgusting. I've never had it since. And I've never wanted it since. And it's funny because my son tried it recently too. And he was like, Oh my God. Oops. Um, something just dropped over there. But my son was like, oh, my God, it was so disgusting. I don't know how people could have uh, made this their drink du jour and then killed themselves on it because it tastes so bad. But I'm like, sometimes it's because it tastes so bad that people train themselves to drink it. Look at smoking. The first time anyone tries a cigarette, it's disgusting. It hurts. You don't like it, but you just train yourself to keep doing it. There's something about uh, self-abuse that's mm -hmm. incredibly... Um, seductive you know the sublime whisper of the bad habit right <laughs> yeah and also because i mean when it comes to smoking perhaps not so much perhaps for certain people it relieves stress a little bit but when it comes to alcohol i mean it has some positive effects at least while it lasts <laughs> i mean people well yeah 
it, it, I, I mean, it, it was psychologically, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so perhaps that's why people come back to it, not so much because of the its taste, because, I, I mean, it's an acquired taste. It's not that alcohol is really that great in terms of taste in general. No, no, it's not. Yeah. So, yeah. By the way, have you been reading more Fernando Pessoa recently or not? Not recently, but um, I want to read them. It's called The Message, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm, I was that's thinking... That's on my nightstand. I want to read The Message. I read The Book of Disquiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the heaviest one. Yeah. It, yes. And, um, and I'd like to read The Message. Do you have any other... Like, wh who are your favorite... Um, Portuguese novelist. Is there anyone oh, by, right by now? The way, or... By the way, the message is compulsory reading here in Portuguese school. So. Ah, okay. Yeah. So you not only read it, but you studied it in class. You talked about its meaning. And... Uh, yeah, and we studied the several different Pessoa uh, uh, atronyms. So because he has, he, he basically he has different atronyms. It's uh, Alberto Queiro, Álvaro de Campos, Ricardo Reis, uh, and and then uh, the one from the book of Disquiet is, oh my God, I forgot his name. But uh, I mean, it's basically several. He had different heteronyms, right? So, what I mean, take me through what what's required reading for you in um... here in Portugal. Uh, yeah, say in high school. I mean, high school. I know you don't call it high school. Do you call it gymnasium, the way they do in? Uh, no, no. I, I mean, we have a particular Portuguese word for it, but it's equivalent to high school. Yeah, it's okay. ba it's basically the tenth, the eleventh, and the twelfth grade. So same exact same years, because I, you yeah. know, I can. I, I don't know exactly. I mean, I know a little bit of what um what's required reading now because of our kids, but that's mm -hmm. it's it's kind of changing as we speak. But when I was growing up, um, it was, you know, we would at least read a couple of Shakespeare plays, mm -hmm. um, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, obviously, Huckleberry Finn. Yeah. Um, those were, those were the books, The Diary of Anne Frank, those were the books that, that were required reading for us. What was required reading for you? Oh my God, don't Besides tell the message. Don't tell me I read all of your required readings. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, because I did at least the ones I ma you mentioned, I read yeah. them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. here in Portugal, I mean, because uh, we have uh, in uh, English classes in high school, right. at least for most, um, we call it uh, courses here. I mean, because yeah. when you go to high school, you have to pick a particular course, either mm -hmm. science and technology or humanities or computer science, I mean, whatever, or a professional, right. a, a more professional thing. Um, but I think that most of them have English classes. Some of them you can pick French classes or other languages, but... Uh, I had English classes in high school, but we didn't really read uh, English literature, you know. So, yeah. um, so, but in Portu in Portuguese classes, we read some of the of our biggest authors, like uh, Luiz de Camões, who wrote. I think that in English it's the Lusiad. It's one of the biggest. Uh, epic poems i mean next to the divine comedy and wow, okay. uh, and homer and the, right. the, those kinds of that kind of people um louis de camões and then we read also jose saramago you probably heard of saramago right the nobel prize yes okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. we we read, um, how would it be in English? Uh, in Portuguese, it's Memorial do Convento. Uh, well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how would it be in, in English. But we read Saramago, and then uh, in our last year, we read also 
Fernando Pessoa, not the book of this quiet. I mean, I, I, I had a... I, I did sort of an essay on that book, but it was just <laughs> for the fun. I mean, it was from my own initiative. <laughs> so uh, I, I read the book of this quiet, but basically what was required reading was the message and then some poems from the several different heteronyms. So it's... Um... It's heavily yeah, yeah. based, obviously, the, the, in Portuguese classical literature. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it yeah, and then you also outside of Portuguese Palmer. classical literature, then it skews more towards English and French, correct? Like, mm -hmm. if you're going to if you're gonna read something that's outside of Portuguese classical literature, then it will skew either towards the English or the French. Uh, yeah, but, to, I mean, I had uh, French classes uh, right. before high school and English classes since middle school, but... Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't read any books there, we yeah. and we didn't have any required readings there. It was just, I mean, conventional language classes. Right, just to get proficient in the language. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, what was the first book that you read in another language, whether English or French, like fiction? Do you remember? The first book. Uh, yeah, because of my age back then, it was probably Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I think I was, wait, wait a minute, was that it or was it Lo the Lord of the Rings, the Two Tower? I mean, one, one of them, one of those books, uh, because I know that I did it when I was like, 11 or 12 because i i remember that back in it, it was it 2001 when the the first harry potter and lord of the rings movies came out that would make sense it seems yeah. like it would, it oh, would okay have... okay so i would be 11 back then and the movies came out and i was so fascinated by them that <laughs> i read the books immediately after I even read The Two Towers and The Return of the King before the movies came out. Uh, so, yeah. So I was doing something that people nowadays don't like a lot, that I, I was spoiling myself before <laughs> the movies came out. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, it was probably uh, Harry Potter and The Goblet of Fire or Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. Do you uh, prefer reading uh, a translation into Portuguese or do you prefer reading it in the original language it was written if you're reading a, a book or does uh, it not matter? Uh, uh, no, I mean, if I, if I know the language, if I can read the language, then I prefer the original. But, much, but for, I mean, by leaps and bounds, I mean, it has not... The translation many times completely misses terrible. the point. Yeah, yeah. I, I, translation is, I think, the hardest thing to get right. Yeah. Um, especially if uh, it's... especially in fiction. Yeah, because because it's... in science, for example, uh, there's not much of an issue because you have e either you use the the exact same terms that are usually English terms, or you have some term that is technical and you always use that term in that particular context so no big deal but when it comes to fiction yeah it's it's a mess it, it is and i um i mean i've i've translated a couple of plays from czech to english and i you know looking back and i i really i did my best and, and i'm and i'm a good writer but Looking back, I think I made a real mess of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I can see now where I got, you know, I was in my 20s too. And so um, I had limited experience. But I can see now where I made a mess of the author's original intent. Now, that wasn't such a bad thing because the, the play that I'm referring to that I translated was absolutely terrible. It was a communist propaganda play. And so I actually ended up kind of improving it just because it was so bad, mm -hmm. but I didn't get it right. That's for sure. 
Yeah, but don't blame yourself too much for it because there, I think that there are things that are not. Is that a word translatable? I hope it is. I think there are things that are not translatable at all. So it's, how do you it's, translate poetry, for instance? I mean, really, how do you translate poetry? Because it's not just about the words on the page. It's not just about the meaning of the, of the words, even. It's, it's about the lyrical quality within that language. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's about exactly. alliteration. It's exactly. about rhyme. How, I mean, how on earth can you possibly translate poetry in that sense? I mean, look, for example, um, I don't, uh, I don't understand, I, I understand very little of spoken and written, uh, for that matter, Japanese. Mm -hmm. uh, I just uh, took like uh, a 30 hour course back in 2012 or something like that and that's it. So just a extremely basic level of Japanese that I have. Uh, but uh, I mean when I watch anime for example I can't bear watching it if it's... Uh, of course I have the, um, the subtitles sure. in English usually but I can't bear watching it if it's not with the original voices in Japanese. I, uh, yeah, I, I can't bear watch it if it's not uh, like I, that. I, that. That bothers me too. Um, <laughs> when I was living in when I was living in Prague, they would dub a lot of um, television series, right? And it was always the same six actors, you know. So <laughs> yeah. and, and we used to watch it just to make fun of it, you know, because you'd turn on Dallas, for instance, and it was like. And then you turn on um, Magnum P.I. <laughs> you know, and it was the same exact actors. Hale, Magnum, Sojelash, you know, and then you turn on MASH, Hawkeye, <laughs> you know, and we would just we would just laugh about it, but it was, it completely took you out of the television series. I I couldn't stand um the dubbing at all even uh, you know i much 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 rather oh uh, and i and i know and i know that there are countries where for example when they dub the anime they sometimes also change visual aspects so for example there's an anime where a character is a smoker and they change <laughs> they take the cigar out then they put a lollipop <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, come on, really? Come I, 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 on. I know that these, the target audience here is children, but come on. But children can see somebody smoke, you know? <laughs> yeah, and they, they won't have immediately. They relatives that they've seen smoke. They've seen someone smoke on a street corner, for heaven's sake. Yeah, and I mean, they It can be depicted. I, I saw there depicted. that... Uh, I saw there in the U.S., in the US yeah. they did that with a particular anime and I was and I just thought this is even more ridiculous than doing the, than doing it in Europe because yeah. in America you really have lots of social condemnation of smokers and in Europe you don't have much of that so it if if you were worried about that you should do it in Europe and not in the US because I mean it won't stick with children so you know, it's funny. I think that smoking is making a comeback um, among young people here in the U.S. Oh, really? Yeah. I think that um, it's starting to be sort of like a cool underground thing to do. Obviously, you can't do it anywhere here. I mean, you can't do it in bars. You can't do it in restaurants. But I imagine, so I think it largely happens in people's apartments. It's like smoking is the new weed. Smoking cigarettes, where you can now just smoke weed anywhere you want, but well, not really. But um, you uh, you can't smoke cigarettes. So I think that there is this this sort of underground subculture of smokers that has developed. Um, but I mean, because you also in reaction to the draconian anti-smoking campaign that was really successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, mm -hmm. it got a lot of people to quit smoking and improve their health for sure. I'm I'm I'm. Uh, I'm not knocking it for that, but um, you know, when you when you do that, young people especially, they they want to do things that are 
sublime, you know, that they're not supposed to do, that are, um, that are you know, a taboo or something like that. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah. But I mean, because you also live there in Europe, uh, what I yeah. said is right, correct? That yeah. there in the US, there's much more social condemnation oh. of smokers than in Europe. Without question. Uh, honestly, if you went into, say, a white collar job, an interview for any white collar job, and they smelled smoking on you, I think you would probably uh, be in, at risk of not getting the job. I think it's that. Um, taboo, I suppose, mm -hmm. or impolite, not even taboo, because taboo is, it implies something a little stronger, I think. Um, but it's, it's, it's impolite. It's also, I think it's a class issue here now. I mean, apart from the, the teens who are doing it, I think that, um, but uh, it's so a class it issue. A class issue, meaning that uh, you know, once you're once you're of a certain class, middle class, and above, mm -hmm. if you don't smoke, because that's just that's not what you do. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I honestly don't find that social condemnation that bad. I mean, because I. No. I mean, because it's really bad for it's your terrible. health. It's terrible yeah. for you. Yeah, no, that's yeah. why I'm saying I'm not knocking it. I'm just describing mm -hmm. what is mm -hmm. and kind of watching it happen. Yeah. Um, it's I don't uh, I don't regret that fewer people smoke and that it's become something that, you know, is not acceptable in polite society. That's probably a net good for society that people don't smoke. Well, but and and good for you. And good for you because the, uh, there's lots of libertarians there, and because of amendments to your constitution and things related to free speech and whatever, that you have that sort of social condemnation because it really runs counter to many different yeah. principles that you hold there. Because, for example, here in Europe, there are other things where people are more strict when it comes, for example, to. Uh, free speech there are many yeah. type many more types of speech here that really have legal consequences than in legal the US uh, and things related yeah. to hate speech as well so yeah yeah what i mean besides hate speech which which is the most obvious one um what types of speech are um limited in portugal what types of speech yeah, uh, is I mean, there, I mean the, the types of speech that would have legal ramifications, I'm not sure the, if they go much beyond hate speech and things like just, uh, I'm missing the legal term here, but when you basically damage the reputation of someone, but you also oh, right. have I that, you also have that in the US, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that, that's uh, in the US, that's the same. Yeah, but I, I guess that perhaps, I don't know, there are some um, particular issues where I find that perhaps there's more, not so much legal, but social condemnation if people talk openly about them here in in Europe in general, but Portugal specifically. So, for example, here, um, I mean, apart from very small and fringe groups, uh, fringe social groups, I mean, you pe uh, people won't let you get away with uh, uh, saying racial slurs or I mean, ju yeah, ju just yeah. just just talking about race in general or, yeah. or w without uh, condemning certain attitudes right. or that, that are raced, uh, racist or something like that. I mean, even just um, <clears throat> just suggesting that perhaps there are innate differences between races would bother people. Very right. Much. Or genders. Yeah. Or it, it, that's the same here. Um, and while it's not, um, 
while technically it's protected speech, uh, it is it can get you banned from social media, which is the town square. So private companies are actually policing speech quite a bit here. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know that we have. Um, I don't really know what the free speech that our constitution allows us, whether that's in practice really what's happening. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, we, we've always had social condemnation and that's a, that's a really good way of forcing politeness, you know, and forcing a, a people to get along, right? If you're not allowed to talk about, um, you know, you're not allowed to say misogynistic things or, or racist things or, or um, anything of that ilk. Um, and, you know, that's, that's been a very effective way of getting people to get along and to be polite to one another and to, mm -hmm. to consider other people's feelings. Um, and I think that used to be really the primary way, but now, you know, it's, it's also social media companies, which will, um, I mean, I think they each have slightly different policies on it, but they will mm -hmm. ban you for certain speech and ban you for life. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I mean, I only got banned for a day from Facebook for saying damn Canadians, but <laughs> that shows you how sensitive though, how sensitive the, the, um, the platforms are mm -hmm. to speech yeah. when something like that uh, can become an issue, albeit only for 24 hours. They, you know, they didn't ban me for life or anything like that, but yeah. um, <clears throat> that does give you an idea of how sensitive the issue is. And it, you know, we're, <sighs> I guess we're, we're trying to figure out how to manage this new enormous worldwide town square that we have. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, for, for me, for me, over time, these questions surrounding free speech, hate speech, and all of that have become more and more complicated. I don't know if it's because okay. I live in a country where uh, we're not we're not enculturated into thinking that free speech should be absolute or and we right. don't have and we don't have the kinds of pro constitutional protections that you have there uh, for freedom of expression and that kind of thing Pro possibly that's w one of the reasons why for me it's a more complicated issue than for a, an american for example but Sometimes I find myself questioning if um, really uh, legally prohibit prohibiting people from uh, saying certain things and expressing certain ideas, at least when it comes to the more extreme examples and extreme cases, is really that bad. Because, because I... I don't know if all ideas really, or all ideas really <laughs> contribute to something positive in the, if you want to call it that, the marketplace of ideas. I think that some of them are just, I don't know, they are they don't bring anything anything positive to the table. Like, like for example, just... uh, I I don't know, j just a quick example using racial slurs i right. mean I, I mean for me it's just silly yeah I, i'm not sure if they should be banned but i get it why people at least would would socially condemn condemn that kind of speech because i, I mean why what if, value does it if, bring? if if it's <laughs> if, if you don't need to use those terms, if you can just um, call people African American or African Americans or something like that, why use racial slurs? I mean, it's not necessary. And why would it be that much of an infringement on your freedom of of speech, of speech to not use a racial slur? And and sometimes it's. 
it seems to me that people who use them, of course, not perhaps in certain contexts, we always have to look at the context, like, for example, if you're a comedian or something like that, okay, right. that's, that's another story. But uh, just using them in your daily life or whatever, sometimes it just seems to me that people who, who use them really mean bad things when they when they do that yeah and well it really depending on context obviously if you're reading mm -hmm. from huckleberry finn versus well, calling someone yeah. yeah yeah of course depending on context i think that you're, you're right i mean there is no i don't i don't see a value to to calling somebody terrible names you know i was listening to an interesting podcast they uh, had this guy on i can't remember his name i wish i could but he has been um basically um, policing is the wrong word. I was going to say policing online forums since the early 1980s, but more like, um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess he has been policing them. He's been sort of studying and implementing ways in which to make group forums, you know, where people are not talking face to face. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't necessarily um, have the governors on them that they would, you know, if, if they were talking to someone directly and making sure that those forums um, don't go off the rails. And he was saying something that made a great deal of sense to me. He said, it's not about policing concepts and ideas. Those, he's like, I, I don't think those should be policed. I don't think there's any reason to police concepts or ideas. He said, what you, what you do is you you put in rules of um, basically manners mm -hmm. that if the rules of any online forum are about manners and not about the content of the speech, you know, that you can mm -hmm. take either in or out of context, you know, that you cannot call somebody names. Mm -hmm. You just can't do that. It's not polite. You can't obviously um, make threats against them. Mm -hmm. Whatever you say, you have to say um, in a, pol you know, you have to, you have to be polite about it and you have to express yourself in a certain manner. And he said that, you know, when you, when you manage to get a forum to, to behave within those boundaries, mm -hmm. it said it completely changes the conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it, it makes almost anything a debatable topic because mm -hmm. people are able to, to, to say things with a certain level of dignity to mm -hmm. one another and empathy. And um, I think, so that's where, I mean, I agree with you. I don't think there's really any reason to be calling people names. That's just, that's, that's not gonna convince anyone of anything. That's not, all it does is helps somebody who is probably a little unhinged feel a little better because they've unburdened themselves. Yeah, but it doesn't but... do anything, to, but, it, but it makes everybody else feel worse. That's you know? what I was going to say, because you can also have the extreme version of free, free speech absolutism that mm -hmm. is absolutely childish. I mean, it's yes. like I yes. want to have the right to say anything, anywhere, in any context, and I don't Nonsense. care at all about yeah. other people and other yeah. people. And you've never, and it's, it's, it's completely false because you've never had that right. No, look. There have always the, been the, consequences to saying something childish and stupid and angry, even, and, you know, even in a public forum. Even in hunter gatherer societies, that doesn't exist. Yeah. That never oh, exists. Well, they could kill you. If yeah. You that never. It wouldn't be unusual for them to kill you. Absolutely. You know, it's, Absolute yeah. free speech. You can never. Get out of, you can get thrown out of a, a meeting. You can get yeah. thrown out of a restaurant. And, and, and because of that, and because rude. of that, and because as humans, we know that there are social norms and in right. particular contexts, you can use certain words and not others. And you have to talk this yes. way and not that way with particular people with, yes. within your family, your friends, your colleagues, your boss. I mean, whatever. Everyone yeah. knows that's how things work. There are... Uh, yeah. th there are rules of speech everywhere in e yeah. for any context. Yes, e e 
it's ridiculous to say that you should be able to say whatever you want in any context. It's ridiculous also because it's a non-informed position because if you teach that to someone, then you will be condem condemning them to a lot of uh, failure and due to social condemnation because right. what you're going to do, you're going to talk to your boss using racial slurs or saying whatever comes to your it's mind. It's absurd. I, I mean, yeah. come on. That, that, yeah. that, or making that inappropriate doesn't... comments to, to your female colleagues or yeah, whatever right. it is. It, of course, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, or I mean, it just yeah. seems narcissistic to me. At least in the more extreme version, yeah. it just yeah. seems yeah. narcissistic. I mean, the, the whole spirit of of free expression in our constitution is about the free expression of ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's about being able to discuss. you know, diff difficult things without um, fear of condemnation, without, uh, you know, being able to express your religion, being able to, um, I mean, the way, the way I look at free speech, and certainly in the context of our country, is that I do think that if done right, you know, um, if we are, when, when we're able to have conversations with uh, and treat each other with dignity. We can have even the most difficult conversations and we can get somewhere. But that dignity aspect has to be there because if you're, um, if you are approaching someone um, with, without grace, without respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean- Any of us, nowhere. Th that conversation's not gonna go anywhere. You're not gonna be able to come to any kind of agreement you're not even going to be able to productively disagree yeah. when that's the spirit in which you have that discussion. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and again, it always boils down to context because even when it comes to humor and comedy, I mean, there's a specific context to it. Mm -hmm. And outside that context, it's a completely different story because, I mean, even hearing sometimes certain comedians saying that uh, a comedy or humor has no limits. I mean, that's also ridiculous because just go to, for example, a, a different society and try telling a joke in a particular context where it's inappropriate. And yeah. then you will learn that humor has limits. So, I mean... Come on, well, that, that's just being silly, childish, and uninformed. So. Well, it's it's comedy is all about discipline. Yeah. You know, I mean, stand-up comedy, for instance, which is, I think, a sort of uniquely American form of comedy. Not to say that it doesn't happen elsewhere, but yeah. I mean, it originated here, and and it's it's it's, um, it's very American, but. Even that, I mean, the work that goes into a comedy special for a comedian, mm -hmm. um, the amount of times that they've tried out a certain joke on an audience. Exactly. The yeah. discipline that it takes. I mean, once you hear, once you're actually at a place where you hear that naughty joke, that joke mm -hmm. that you're, you're that when they say that thing that they're not supposed to say, whatever that mm -hmm. is, they've, they have worked on that joke probably in front of an audience. Yeah. Yeah, they tried it out to see what and works. They've and figured out, yeah. they figured out that balance where that joke is teaching us something about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the reason people are laughing at the joke isn't because, ha, 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 isn't it funny to, to you know, laugh at whatever gender or race or whatever it is that, that you know, is verboten. But because we're able to laugh at ourselves and we see ourselves in the joke. And... Um, and perhaps in that case, able to get to sort of a greater truth, right? Something mm -hmm. that that um, that helps us see the situation either anew or um, accept a contradiction within ourselves. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, it's never. It's just not funny to have um, just to 
to have insults. I mean, with the exception mm. of Don Rickles, but he did it very, you know, he, he, you know, he, he had a style all his own. And the whole point with, with, I think Don Rickles being an insult comic is that he insulted everybody equally. And so the whole point of his insult comedy was that everyone is equal in the insult, Yeah, you know? And so that's a commentary, that's a social commentary. And without the social commentary aspect of it, it I, I, I think that those jokes would fall flat anyway, because I, I don't, an audience is smarter than that. They don't want to laugh at an insult for an insult's sake because it's, oh, isn't it fun to, to, um, you know, point at this guy or this girl. Yeah. It's why I don't think it's funny, the sort of political comedy, um, the clapter that we talked about, where I don't think it's funny to just get on a stage and say, I hate Trump. I just don't think that's funny. Or I hate, or, or ha ha, I hate Biden. It's what is that teaching us? You know, what is that teaching us about ourselves? How is that helping us um, see our fellow citizen, yeah. you know, or yeah. our politicians? What is that teaching us? It's nothing. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and, uh, and I mean, the, as you said, they, it's not that everything works. They, they try out different approaches, different jokes. Uh, I mean, I think that Dave Chappelle talks about this in one of his yeah. interviews or documentaries or yeah. something like that, uh, that he went for a long time in smaller venues, trying out different jokes to see what it what worked and what didn't yeah. work. So, I mean, yeah, he's, he's so really good. just saying, just claiming that humor or comedy has no limits, I mean, it, it's silly. Because obviously it has limits. It's not that anything that sounds funny to you will be comedy. So no, I, it's, and it's, I mean, it's a lot more complicated than that. We can even get to extreme examples. So <laughs> even awful examples. If you go back to Nazi Germany and uh, the Holocaust and the uh, concentration camps. There were probably, and that was portrayed in certain movies and books, there were probably uh, Nazi officials there making certain Jews behave, making them behave like dogs or something like that. And, yeah. and, they, and they laughed at it. So it yeah. was, for them, it was comedy. But for, for us, it just for us, it's just yeah, It's just exactly. atrocious. So I, yeah. I mean, again, Context, context, culture, and particular personal sensitivities, and all of that kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I and I'm saying all of this about free speech, and it's not that I'm. I just want to ban speech that I don't like. Uh, I mean, I explore yeah. very. <laughs> fringe topics sometimes even on my channel and podcast and I'm very much open to all kinds of different ideas and artistic expressions and all of that kind of thing and uh, I mean I love uh, comedians like George Carlin, Bill Hicks, Ricky Gervais so I, I mean nobody I will, nobody will tell me the, that I'm just bland or something like that uh, but but even George Carl, Carlin in an interview said, uh, I remember this, that um, uh, people should sometimes should be more thoughtful about the jokes they make because they should be directed more at the powerful than at the downtrodden, for example. He said that. And yeah. I mean, sometimes the jokes he made I, I mean, you almost felt the rope breaking. So, yeah, it's true. And and I think it's easy to because, uh, you know, we've heard the jokes now for several decades, but it's it's easy to take for granted. Um, well, they were just so they were so taboo and powerful then, you know, when he the when he did the um, is it seven, the, the, 
the, the words that you're not allowed to say, you know. Yeah. Um, that then turned into an infinite it, list of words. Yeah, I, and, and that's where this is all so confusing because here we are saying, well, it's not funny just to say a certain word, but then he proved it was. Yeah. But that's not all he was doing either. It was so much more sophisticated than that. And, um, and, and it, it, this is where we are trying to figure out what exactly context means because not only I think it was probably easier um, before we became a more global society and we just keep heading more and more in that direction because we were we were only dealing with well our own cultures really oh mm. not only but largely you know when you went to um, I don't know. You were, I'm, I'm, we were largely re reading or watching comedy that that we all had a reference for, um, because we we grew up listening to the same music or watching the same television shows, whatever it is. All the cultural cues that we had that help us that helped us make sense of the comedy that we were watching and that help us see the layers in it and the sophistication in it, um, but. You know, now here we have, again, these global platforms and we're trying to figure out what free speech means, whatever mm -hmm. that is, because what was free, free speech mean to someone in Russia or in China? That's easy to say because those are more, uh, well, those are obviously, well, in China's case, a totalitarian country. But what does free speech mean in Germany yeah. or France? Yeah. And how does that differ from the United States? And now how are we going to manage what free speech means on this platform that welcomes the German and the French mm -hmm. and the Canadian and the American and the English yeah. and the, the Irish and, you know, and everyone from Luxembourg, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, how, what does that mean? How, how are we, um, how are we going to, uh, come to an agreement? a fair agreement that allows ideas mm -hmm. to be talked about um, yeah. robustly and respectfully so that we are not dumbing ourselves down, so that we're not um, minimizing certain points of view to our own um, detriment because mm -hmm. we need to hear them in order to either discount them or to take what is true. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I'm really, when I'm, I'm really talking about science here. You know, COVID is an obvious example because it, here we were dealing with a global pandemic for the first time when, well, maybe not for the first time, but for the first time when we could all talk about it and we could all figure out what we're going to do about it mm -hmm. and um, trying to come up with solutions in real time. Uh -oh. So naturally mistakes were going to be made. But um, I think it was it's been incredibly challenging for these platforms to figure out what can be discussed about COVID, what dissenting point of views are allowed and which ones aren't. Yeah. How do well, we do I that? Mean, I, I think that probably the people who are the best equipped to tackle these questions are the anthropologists. Yeah. But on the one hand, because they are very well aware of cultural differences and on the other hand particularly if they've done field work i mean for them it's even more dramatic because they really know that you have to learn and respect the social norms otherwise you will be dead soon <laughs> in, at least in particular <laughs> societies um, but yeah i mean people just have to perhaps even if they find that uh, or even if they think because of the way they've been brought up um, that it's really more oppressive or something like that, they really have to expand their horizons and uh, at least get to learn a little bit more or at least have a notion that in other cultures things don't function the same way and you can't simply go to a new culture and say wherever comes to your mind that is yeah. normal in your own native culture because I, I mean you can do that but you probably don't get good results so yeah 
and I, and I mean that, that guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's I mean that's just how human societies are. I mean there are differences, and if you want to get along with people from other cultures, you have to respect at least some basic yeah. norms, and for that you have to learn them. Yeah, you do. You have to figure out how you can talk about certain topics. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, that's why I say, and in earlier episodes, we probably talked about uh, how silly it is to police people's speech and all uh, and those kinds of things. But today, uh, I'm just making a, a case for um, perhaps not taking things to the extreme because right. uh, it becomes silly. It becomes silly to just say that you should be able or have the right to say whatever you want in any kind of context. Also, because if it's not, if it doesn't have any sort of legal consequences, I mean, you you won't get away with it socially. So. Yeah, and I, I actually think that the, the social consequences are far more powerful than when um, or are as powerful. I mean, obviously, legal consequences, if you're going to be tossed in prison, that's a pretty powerful deterrent. But um, a few people want to say something that is going to cost them friends, respect, work. Yeah. Um, which, for one, which is why I think we need to be generous towards people who, who make a, a, a mistake. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, there are, there are going to be provocateurs who just want to say something just for the sake of saying them, obviously. Um, and um, Those are usually folks who are trying to get attention <laughs> rather than than have a real conversation, but um, but I think that those social strictures they work. I think mm -hmm. they work very well. And um, if we, I, I do think that if 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 we put those strictures on that are that are more geared towards manners and treating one another with dignity, mm -hmm. then like we said, you can have we, you can have all sorts of conversations. You can really take things to the edge and you can have a robust debate about an extremely contentious topic mm -hmm. and yet um, walk away from that without feeling utterly demoralized, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I <laughs> guess that probably on the internet it's an even more dramatic phenomenon because you have more anonymity, at least many times you have it. And uh, also you don't, you're not interacting with people face to face, so you don't get their reaction in terms of facial expressions yeah. and perhaps some threats of physical violence sometimes. And so, yeah. uh, and, and so you feel much more at ease saying just stupid things, but that's probably one of the reasons why you have uh, what people call trolls. I mean, trolls are yeah. the online manifestation of what I was talking about earlier. That, that kind of people who just want to say whatever they want without any consequences. And what they say is usually not productive at all. So when, no. when people say that we should have absolute freedom of speech because that's what leads to good ideas whatever i mean i don't think that's true at all i think that sometimes people say things that are just absolutely unproductive so. well to me trolls are like the little evil voice that we all have in our own heads and sometimes that voice is is directed at ourselves right like you'll never make anything of yourself. Why did you even try that? You know, you're just going to fail. You know, that, that voice that says terrible things to, to, to you, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that 
that voice is directed at at other people, sometimes even at people that you really love, even would give your life for. You know, we've all had those little evil thoughts mm -hmm. that um, that visit us. Um, it's why you don't read somebody's diary for heaven's sakes, because that's that's a place where we can exercise those thoughts, you know, where we can say, God, you know, my my sister was driving me nuts. I wish she'd move away. You know, I can't take her anymore, you know, but you'd never want your sister to read that because maybe that 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 sister is your best friend too and would be you know so hurt if she ever read that and it would cause real damage in your relationship if, if she read it because she would um whoops that's my dog <laughs> um she, uh, she she would interpret that in a way that placed a lot more emphasis and importance on that that evil little statement than it deserves because it it, oftentimes that really is just a way that you were feeling on a given day because you were in a bad mood, you know, and trolls embody that. So I, I don't know, maybe in some weird way they do have a, a purpose in that regard. And there are people who are really quite hilarious trolls and are, and are able to bring um, a different point of view to an argument where you're like, hmm. Um, but mostly when you go through and read comments let's say on social media and the the troll comments come out mostly that you're right they are so unproductive they don't um bring anything new or interesting to the conversation what they really do just sound like is you know a, a, a sort of quick and vicious mm -hmm. uh verbal assault by someone who um could probably use a therapist <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, many times it just seems to me that they just want to harm other people. J yeah. That's just what they They're want to do. They're just angry that, that this yeah. is just somebody who um, who who wants a you know a free swing at someone mm -hmm. yeah. um, because they feel perhaps that that they are not heard. Yeah, and on the internet, it's Absolutely. easy for them to do that because they don't yeah. suffer any direct exactly, consequences. Exactly, because it's not their face. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's And they, they've got some fake name. Yeah. That's next to their... Yeah, or even sometimes, even if it's not a fake name, they're in a group where no one knows them personally. Right, so. exactly. And no one's even gonna rem going to remember who they are. Yeah. So basically no social consequences again yeah yeah so bring you know how do we how do we bring back those social consequences and yet um allow a, a robust discussion of ideas you know without banning the ideas banning the 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 approach i guess not banning the approach but modifying the approach incentivizing um a constructive approach to yeah. a debate. I mean, uh, earlier we were talking about realism in fiction, but we can mm -hmm. probably also apply that to social media because <laughs> apart, fr apart from trolling, which is, uh, I would say, a very much genuine expression, even though it's harmful and hateful yeah. and all of that. But it's genuine. I think it's genuine. Uh, but you also have something like, that perhaps we could call oversharing. Uh, just the other day, I mean, the day we're recording this interview, it's not out yet, but I had a, an interview with a philosopher who wrote an interesting book on honesty, and we were talking about uh, the phenomenon of oversharing. I mean, people yeah. nowadays on social media and in many cultures across the globe have this idea that they should be as genuine as possible, expose as much as of their life as possible on the internet and on the public sphere and yeah. whatever. Uh, and I mean, of, of course, uh, uh, you could you can debate if that's being if that's an issue of being too honest or if. If if it's going against the virtue of discretion, or I mean, whatever, it doesn't matter. But it's still, yeah. still, 
you shouldn't teach people that they should expose their lives completely to, I mean, like most other people, and unless they are very close friends or family or someone like that. I couldn't agree but, more. But, no, but nowadays there's this idea that people should be as genuine as possible and being genuine means specifically, uh, as I said, oversharing and exposing yourself completely and sharing even the worst uh, aspects of your life and the worst episodes of your past. I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah, discretion is something that we're having to to reimagine mm. and renegotiate um and but you're right i mean it's it's sometimes it's horribly cringy what people post mm. and it's not just because they're posting intimately about themselves or their loved ones sometimes it's cringy because they're humble bragging do you know what humble bragging is right mm. <laughs> pretending to be humble but really uh, bragging. I, yeah, yeah, yeah yeah you know what i mean um, it's, there are all sorts of ways in which we've sort of trans transgressed very publicly over what used to be pretty strict boundaries that, that we all understood. And yeah. when we, you know, when we made a mistake and we shared too much, back then it used to be with an individual and then we'd get punished and be like, oh my God, I know they're just going to tell everybody and it's going to get misconstrued. And now it's it's out there often for hundreds, thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people to see if something goes viral. And um, yeah, and you have to take into I account know. also that probably if you put something on the internet, it will never go away. So. Right. Right. Someone will always be able to unearth it. And um, again, uh, and take it out of context. I mean, yeah. what if it was just a joke between friends yeah. and that might sound bad or look bad when you see it at face, you know, at face value. But, um, but if you understood the preceding conversation and the context around it, it would be completely innocuous, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I guess that another thing that goes associated with these sort of oversharing is uh, also, uh, I mean, goes back to something we were talking about earlier, having to do with fragility because associated with this idea of, having to be genuine and genuine in this particular oversharing way is that, um, I mean, it seems like sometimes people can't go through the issues they have in life and, uh, and solve whatever, whatever kind of problem they have without uh, sharing with someone that they're going through these and they're suffering and whatever. I mean, again, some discretion is warranted and also perhaps a little bit more of uh, something that perhaps comes more from honor cultures or something like that, where, yeah. where, I mean, come on, just try to be a little bit more self-reliant. I mean, you don't, it's not that for any small issue that you come across, you have to ask for other people's help or, uh, exposed to the entire world that you're going through an issue or suffering or whatever. So. Yeah, we could we could all read a little bit of a uh, little bit more of Marcus Aurelius and on stoicism, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this episode until the end. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and consider making a pledge there starting at $1 per month. You also have links to PayPal. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. 
Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Ernst Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf, Alex, Jonathan Vissel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bird Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Nassi, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, o Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Cavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguenzo, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreff, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Unig, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Alman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackleford, and Sunny Smith. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stefaniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Agdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardos France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivet. Thank you for all.